Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in electrochemistry. If you were with us yesterday, you would have seen that we carried on with electrochemistry and we had discussed the galvanic cell. So today we're going to move on to electrolytic cells. And um, some of you might be thinking, but wait, we hadn't quite finished discussing galvanic cells. There's how much more that you need to teach us. Yes, I admit there are extra things that I need to go through with you guys, but I'm actually doing like a general overview. So at the moment, I've told you how a galvanic cell works, right? Now I'm going to tell you about how an electrolytic cell works, and then we're going to talk about the different things that you need to know about both of them, okay? So don't panic. I promise I will go through everything. So, electrolytic cells. First of all, the electrical energy is converted to chemical potential energy. So, for galvanic cells, it was chemical energy to electrical energy. Think galvanic, voltaic, battery. Electrolytic, we need electricity to make it work, okay? So, it uses an electric current to force a particular chemical reaction to occur. So definition, and guys, you have to learn these definitions. I'm not being stupid and ridiculous when I say learn the definitions. Up to 10% of both your papers, okay? So in other words, 10% of your physics paper and 10% of your chemistry paper can be definitions. They can be. So you need to learn your definitions. And unfortunately for you guys, the rule is the definitions have to be word perfect. Okay. So I would, and I've said this before, I seriously suggest you guys go and find your exam guidelines, your exam guidelines, and go and use them and highlight all the definitions and learn the definitions in the exam guidelines because then you will be fine. Okay. And the definition, the definition says an electrolytic cell is an electrochemical cell that converts electrical potential energy to chemical potential energy by using electricity to drive a non-spontaneous chemical reaction. Okay, so galvanic was spontaneous, electrolytic is non-spontaneous. The process is called electrolysis, and wait for it, there's a definition for electrolysis. And this is a method of driving chemical reactions by passing electric current through an electrolyte. Okay, so that's pretty easy to remember. They're not that difficult. So let's talk about the electrolytic cell. And I've got a little video. And again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play it. Hang on a minute. Wait, stop. I'm going to play it. And then I'm going to play it the first time. And then we will watch it. And then I'll go through it again with you guys nice and slowly. Okay. So here we go. Okay, so the cool thing about this video is it doesn't seem to have sound, so it means I can just talk you through the first one. Okay, so what is happening is this is a copper chloride solution. So you've got CuCl2. Okay, now if you look at this battery, you can see that it's got a long side and a short side. The long side is positive and the short side is negative. What does that mean? It means that this makes this the negative side, okay? because it is connected to the negative end of the battery. And this is the positive side because it's connected to the positive end of the battery. So the whole of this electrode is negatively charged and the whole of this electrode is positively charged because it is connected to the positive end and the negative end, right? So now what happens is the copper two plus the copper two plus breaks, copper chloride breaks into copper two plus and chloride ions, okay? Let me just rewrite this. It goes copper chloride breaks up into copper two plus plus two Cl minus. Copper two plus but two plus two Cl minus. Okay, so now you will, sorry, I keep forgetting it does that. Okay, so if we carry on, you will see that the copper two plus ions are actually being attracted. And this is actually wrong because what is actually happening, hmm, sorry, let me just fix this, is actually happening is that the chloride ions are being attracted, okay? This is not Cl2, this is Cl minus, two Cl minus ions. And what is happening is they are being attracted to the positive electrode. So what is happening is that these two Cl minus ions are being attracted to the electrode, the Cl 
minus ions are being attracted to the positive electrode. By doing that, they become chlorine and they give off their electrons. So they become, if you watch here now, let me go back, you can see that it becomes chlorine. Okay, and it gives off two electrons. So let's the electrons will flow through and it will continue. Okay. At that time, the copper two plus is attracted to the negative cathode. Notice that the cathode is negative. So therefore copper is going to form here. Okay. Whereas, okay, that's the gentleman that made this. Isn't this sweet one? Okay, so if we go back, okay, there we go. Look, this is just going to give off chlorine gas. That's what these bubbles are. It's chlorine gas being given off. And the electrons are going to travel through here. And this is going to be covered or coated with copper. Because what is happening at this electrode is the copper 2 plus is gaining the two electrons from the electrode to form copper. There you go. Okay, so that's an overview of an electrolytic cell and specifically the copper chloride cell. And this is actually one of the ways to isolate both copper and chlorine gas. Okay, so now let's talk theoretically about um, an, an electrolyte, I mean about an electrolyte electrolytic cell. Oh my word, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit tired today. Electrolytic cell. Okay, it says the electrolyte consists of metal cations and spectator anions. Okay, metal cations and spectator anions. So the sulfate, so in other words, yeah, you have got a copper electrode and a copper electrode, just for example. This is positive, okay, and the reason it's the anode is because this is where oxidation occurs. Remember, we don't care about the fact that they're swapping sides, okay. In this case, this is positive because it is an anode. I mean, it's because oxidation occurs. It's an anode because oxidation occurs, yeah. And this is a cathode because reduction occurs, yeah, and I'll show you how that works in a second. So, We've got copper sulfate in solution, which is breaks up into copper 2 plus and SO4 2 minus. Okay, so metals always form cations. So cations being positive ions and the spectator, obviously the spectator anions. The oxidation reduction reactions occur in the same container. It's non-spontaneous, so therefore we have to have a power source. So remember I said to you guys that you've got to understand that when you are actually looking at the difference between galvanic cells, galvanic versus electrolytic, and I mentioned to you electrolytic, and I mentioned to you that you need to actually be very careful about this, that they often say to you, is this a galvanic or electrolytic cell? And the ways to work this out is that this will have a voltmeter or it'll have an ammeter or it'll have a light bulb, but this will have a power supply of some sort. That's one way. Galvanic cells have a salt bridge, whereas electrolytic cells are in the same container. Okay, so there you go. That's how very easy to identify whether something is a galvanic or electrolytic cell. Okay, and electrodes can be the same metal or different metals depending on what you're doing because you're forcing the reaction to happen. You're making it happen. So therefore your electrodes can be the same metal as it is here. Okay, so the electrode is connected to the positive terminal battery, like this one. Okay, to balance this charge, the positive electrode metal atoms are oxidized to form metal ions. Okay, so because this is positively charged, okay, it's positively charged, what happens is that the, it is going to be oxidized. Now remember you've got oil rig. Okay, and oxidation is the loss of electrons. And reduction is the gain of electrons, okay? So what happens is to get rid of the positiveness, because you've got too many positives, the copper breaks up into copper 2 plus and gives away two electrons, okay? The copper breaks up into copper 2 plus and gives away two electrons. Okay, so then what happens is these electrons are now going to flow along here. So the electrons are going to flow from here. Remember that they're flowing this way. The electrons are flowing this way all the way along 
to here. So you'll notice that the electron flow is again going to be anode to cathode. Always. Electron flow is always anode to cathode okay, on the external surface. And you'll notice there's a current flow because they're talking about the conventional current. But the electron flow is from anode to cathode. So electrons go along here. Okay, right. So that's what's happening there. So oxidation is occurring at the anode. Then this now is a negatively charged cathode. Okay. So what happens here is that the positively charged um, cations, your copper two plus ions, copper two plus ions, it see these electrons, so it gets attracted to the copper plate, and it gains these two electrons from this copper plate to form copper. So what's going to happen is that this piece of metal is going to get tied up, okay, this is going to disappear. I wonder if I can do that. No, I don't know what. Okay, let's pretend. Okay, so this bit here is going to go away and it's going to be eaten up, okay? Whereas the other bit, I'm going to sit in red, is going to get bigger. And the reason it's getting bigger is because of the fact that it's got more and more copper around it, okay? So that's what's happening. The ions move into the solution, leaving the electrons on the electrode, and they move around the circuit, okay? Because it makes sense, because now they've got extra electrons, they have to move to the positive electrode, okay? Because they're going from the negative to the positive. Similarly then, which makes this more negative, which is then going to make that and so on and so on. And I've just explained that. Right, now, let's have a look at this electrolysis of water. And again, I'm not sure this sound. Okay, there's not sound, which is awesome, because then I can explain it to you. Okay, so let's go through this, okay? Okay, so what you've got, yeah, this is the electrolysis of water. So if you have to look at this, this is a cathode, this is the anode, okay? They both are, and if you see, it goes all the way down, okay? And then they've got a voltage supply. So this is the equivalent of, seriously, the equivalent of this, where you've got a stick and you've got a stick, better known as electrodes, and you have a beaker filled with water. That's all that they're doing. And they called it this the cathode, which means, if you go back, you can remember, the cathode is connected to the negative electrode. So this is going to be the small one, and this is the big one for this example. So this is the cathode, okay? And this is the anode. And we've got water. Okay, so let's play it and see what happens. So because the cathode is connected, to the voltage supply, okay, right, you can see the little electrons flow along the wire, okay, your water breaks up into, okay, remember that your water is always in a dynamic equilibrium, H2O is always in a dynamic equilibrium of H3O plus plus OH minus, and put it two in front of that. Now, it's easier to write H3O plus as H plus. It's the same thing. And the reason they do it is because if you look at your redox table, you will come across this equation there, which says a 2H plus plus two electrons, oh, 2H plus plus two electrons, forms hydrogen and it goes both ways obviously but this is a cathode and the cathode is negatively charged because it's connected to the negative okay so the, what happens is remember that the cathode reduction is occurring okay so because this is negatively charged the hydrogen which is the h3o plus ions but the hydrogen ions are attracted to the cathode okay the hydrogen ions in the water molecules are attracted to the cathode and they form diatomic molecules of hydrogen gas. So let's watch that. So you can see that they're getting the electrons off the cathode and they form diatomic molecules of gas. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm using a different version of PowerPoint than what I'm used to. So anyway, so now, on the other, the anode, the anode is positively charged, right? So look at this. Yeah, you've got these hydroxyls. So the hydroxyls need to do something. So let's see what happens, okay? So there's your hydrogen gas going off. Excellent. 
Okay, now let's go look at the anode. On the other side, you have your little water molecules. Now this, oh, I don't believe it. Okay, this is the last time I'm doing this. Watch. And press here. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to, okay, there's the formula, 2H2O plus 2 hydrogen plus 2 oxygen. That is the overall reaction, but this is what's actually happening on the anode. You've got your water, which breaks down to oxygen and four hydrogens with four electrons. I really want to show you this. I'm just going to play it and then I'll talk through it. Okay, so we'll start it from... Oh, yes, yeah. so there's your hydrogens forming, right? I'm not going to interrupt the thing. Okay, so what happens is that then over here, you have water which breaks up into oxygens plus four hydrogens plus four electrons, okay? This time it's giving electrons off. It's giving the electrons off and breaking it up. And now we get little oxygen atoms breaking up and then you've got your electron flow. So what we end up with is oxygen on this side and hydrogen bubbles giving off. And there they're showing it. There is the hydrogen bubbles given off and the oxygen given off, okay? Now what's important about this is both hydrogen and oxygen are quite um, flammable, explosive. So they have to, in normal circumstances, okay, not like, in, okay, in, in, in the, if you did this in school, what you generally do is collect this gas in different test tubes and then you test for it. And yeah, it would be a little pop because you're forming hydrogen and this it would burn. If you're doing this on an industrial level, you would actually really need to make sure that you collected them in separate areas, okay? And the reason for this is because they are actually very, very flammable. Okay, so now let's go through the proper science, okay? So this year is what it would look like in your classroom. Okay, so you can see they're keeping oxygen and hydrogen separate. So you've got water and what they've done is they've acidified it. Now the reason they've acidified it is because then it makes it easier for the hydrogens to separate out. Okay, it makes it easier for the hydrogen ions to separate out, which we need because, so it's kind of a catalyst. In fact, it's not kind of a catalyst, it is a catalyst. Um, so it make, breaks, this helps the water break up more easily into your hydrogen plus ions and your hydroxyl ions. So the water undergoes electricity to form hydrogen gas and oxygen gas according to the following reaction. You've got overall, you've got water, which forms hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And the reason this is so important is because hydrogen gas is a potential to be used as an energy source. In fact, there are already places that are using hydrogen as energy sources. Um, there are places in the east, like in Thailand and Japan, where they have cars that actually run on um, this type of electrolysis, where they form fuel from the water and then they burn the hydrogen to form, um, to get to go, to make the cars go. Which is very clever because what happens is when you burn it, you end up with water again. <laughs> okay, so now. You'll notice that it's got two electrodes that are submerged. Yeah, your two electrodes are, and they're submerged in electrolyte connected to a source. And you'll notice that it says graphite, graphite or platinum anode and graphite or platinum cathode. Now, the reason they're using graphite or platinum is that both of those are inert. They don't participate in the reaction. So they're not going to interfere. And it also means that they are not going to be eaten away. Okay, like for example, when we saw the copper, copper electrodes, the copper zinc electrodes, the galvanic cells, nothing is going to be, they don't participate in the reaction at all. So in other words, I could run this electrolysis of the water in this piece of equipment for like 20 years and say those anode and the cathode were both platinum, then I could take it out after 20 years and basically take the platinum out, make a ring out of it and yeah, um, we'll, we'll just sell it because there's nothing wrong with it, okay? Nothing's been done to it. Okay, the oxidation half reaction is that water breaks up into oxygens. Well, okay, you've got two water molecules, break up into two oxygens to form oxygen gas plus four hydrogens and four electrons. The reduction half reaction is the hydrogens 
plus two electrons from hydrogen. So basically you can see that the hydrogens that are given off here are absorbed by, okay, are taken up by this reduction, half reaction to form hydrogen gas. Okay. So now let's talk about the effects of current potential on rates and equilibrium. So remember I said to you that at the beginning I said some of you might be saying no but you haven't taught us everything we need to know about galvanic cells and you're right I didn't. I've basically covered the basis basics of organic of galvanic cells and the basics of electrolytic cells. Now what I want to do is talk about how current and potential difference affect rate and equilibrium. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is that you guys need to understand that you're going to be bringing in your knowledge of rates of reaction and chemical equilibria into your electro electrochemistry. And you have to understand this because they love asking it. They love it, especially if you're in the IB system. They love asking it, okay? So let's just talk about rates of reaction, okay? So rates of reaction are affected by what? Let's just talk about it very briefly. First of all, it's temperature, do you agree? Catalyst, it's size of the particles, so your surface area, and then it's ink or it's concentration, okay? Temperature, catalyst, surface area, concentration, and nature of the reactants. Okay, equilibrium is affected by what? Your chemical equilibrium is obviously affected by your temperature, by your concentration or pressure. Um, temperature, concentration, pressure, and that's it. Okay, so now let's talk about these things. Okay, now you've got your zinc. We're gonna talk again about the zinc and copper electro, um, galvanic cell. And the reason I keep bringing it up because it's very, it's so much easier to understand something with respect to a cell that you're used to. Okay, so let's just run through it very briefly to, in case you miss the lessons or you still don't get exactly what's going on here because you need to understand. Okay, so you'll notice that this is a galvanic cell and it's pretty obvious that it's um, a galvanic cell because like I said to you, you've got a little measuring thing here that tells you that the electricity is flowing. You have a salt bridge and you've got two containers, galvanic cell. Okay, right now we've got a zinc electrode and then we've got zinc sulfate in solution. We've got a copper electrode and copper sulfate in solution and then we've got a salt bridge. And the salt bridge could anything, be anything, it could be sodium chloride, potassium chloride, anything like that. Okay, it's just going to be an ionic solution. Right, so now, okay, I want you to ignore that, that's wrong. I don't know why it's in here. Okay, right. So what happens? You've got two half reactions. You've got zinc. Oh, yeah. Zinc is breaking up into zinc, two plus ions plus two electrons. And then the copper, two plus, plus two electrons is becoming copper. So at the zinc electron, the zinc metal loses electrons. Okay, remember we said that the zinc doesn't hold on to its electrons as strongly as copper, or it isn't as attractive to its electrons as copper. So electrons travel from the zinc to the copper. So therefore, this becomes negatively charged, and this becomes positively charged, okay? And the way it becomes positively charged is because as it gives away its electrons, the zinc is breaking up into zinc 2 plus. So you end up with extra zinc 2 plus ions in the solution. Okay, you get extra ones of those. You also have the sulfate ions, but don't worry about them, they're spectator ions. On this side, there's an excess of electrons and a deficit of electrons on the side, right? So on this side, what happens is the copper 2 plus ions get attracted to the copper electrode. They take up the electrons from the copper electrode and you end up with copper. So this thing gets fatter and fatter and fatter, and this thing gets charred away more and more and more until there's like nothing left. Okay, so electrons, now yeah, we talk, need to talk about current and rate of reaction. The electrons will flow from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So that means the electrons on, on the zinc anode flow through the external circuit towards the more positive copper cathode. So electrons are going to flow from here to here, okay? The larger the difference between the excess and deficit of electrons, the faster the electrons will flow and the greater the current will be. 
and therefore the faster the electrons will flow, the greater the rate of reaction must be. Therefore, the larger the current, the faster the rate of the reaction. Okay, so therefore we know that the larger the current, the larger the current, the greater the rate of the reaction. And guys, if you look on your redox table, and we will talk about this, obviously the greater the difference between your E0, and when I, when I get as far as talk, teaching you about the, the, the EMF of the cells and the, the E theta of the cells, the measurement of that, compared to the standard hydrogen cell, then we'll talk about how it depends on what you're putting with each other, whether you're putting zinc and copper or if you're putting lead and copper and whatever, as to which way the electrons are going to flow and how fast they'll flow because of how strongly each of these metals is attracting the electrons compared to each other. Okay, so for example, if you've got a metal here that really doesn't hold on to its electrons at all and you've got a metal here that really holds on to grabs every single electron it's ever going to see in its entire life then it, obviously the flow is going to be much faster so the rate of electricity will be uh, electrons will be faster and therefore the current will be much greater and that's kind of why if you're going to buy batteries you will see that you get lithium fluoride batteries and you get lithium whatever batteries and then you get the standard um, zinc copper battery, etc., etc., and it all depends, and this is very important, it all depends on whether you want a high voltage or high current cell or both. Okay, because you can have a very high voltage cell which is going to basically give you electricity for a long time, but the chances are is that it doesn't have a very high electron flow rate. In other words, it doesn't have a high current. Whereas you might have a battery that might allow a very high current rate, but not a very long lasting battery, it doesn't have a lot of volts. Okay, so we'll talk about that when we get to your E thetas and EMF of the cell. Okay, now, in a electrolytic cell, a redox reaction takes place when the current is applied. So you can understand that, yeah, yeah, everything is dependent on the difference between these two metals, okay? Now we're talking about the electrolytic cell. Yeah, it's different because yeah, the redox reaction takes place when the current is applied, okay? So basically what we can say is that the rate of decomposition, the rate at which this breaks up, is increased when we increase the current, okay? Obvious, okay? So the bigger the battery, the more current this battery can supply, the faster this reaction is gonna occur. That's how easy that is. Okay, now let's talk about potential difference, equilibrium and concentration. Okay, so back to the galvanic cell, back to the galvanic cell. And again, we are talking about the zinc, copper, zinc battery because it's just easier as the galvanic cell. Okay, so when the chemical reaction between zinc and copper slows down, the increase in product concentration, the decrease in reactant concentration slow too. In other words, do you agree that we're changing this from zinc to zinc to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons and this dude is going from copper 2 plus plus those two electrons goes to copper. So if the reaction, the chemical reaction between and copper slow down, then the rate at which this breaks down and the rate at which this forms is obviously going to slow down which means that the electron transfer rate will decrease as well because if this slows down then obviously it's giving all fewer electrons or just at a, at a slower rate which means the electrons are going to flow more slowly okay so we need to talk about when the chemical reaction in the cell stops this is when we basically say the battery is flat when we put it in our, I don't know, our cell phones or whatever, and we go, oh, the battery's flat again. This is what's happening, okay? It's a little bit different with rechargeable batteries, but it's basically the same thing, okay? So let's talk about it. It says the reaction is no longer converting chemical potential energy to electrical potential energy. It's obvious, right? The concentrations of the reactants and products have become constant and equilibrium has been reached. 
Okay, and this is very important, and it's important here, and it's important when you're talking about chemical equilibrium. We are not saying that the concentrations of the reactants and products are the same. They're not necessarily the same, but they are constant. They're not changing, okay? So the concentration of the zinc 2 plus ions and the concentration of the copper 2 plus ions are now remaining constant, but they're not necessarily equal. They are not necessarily equal, okay? It says there is no excess or deficit of electrons on the electrodes and therefore the potential difference of the cell is zero. In other words, remember that this was flowing, the electrons are flowing was because there was a high concentration of electrons on this one and there was a low concentration of electrons in here. So the electrons are flowing from the zinc to copper to basically to flatten it out, to sort out, um, to equal it out and that's what's happened. When it becomes flat, there is no excess or deficit, okay? They are basically equal. And if the potential difference is zero, it means that the current is zero, and therefore we say that the battery is flat, okay? The potential difference across a cell is related to the extent to which the cell reaction has reached equilibrium. And this is important, and this is what people don't understand. It's not that there is no more chemicals in this reaction. It is just that the, the equilibrium is reached. And that is why you can, depending on the type of battery you have, have the kind of chemicals you have, you can have rechargeable batteries. Because that means that you are forcing the reaction back. Okay, and that totally depends on the type of stuff you've got inside your battery, right? So what has happened is that when the potential difference is zero, and the cell is said to be flat, it's because we've reached chemical equilibrium. We've reached chemical equilibrium. Okay, please note we're not saying dynamic equilibrium. When we say dynamic equilibrium, it means that there's still transfer of things. There are still things going forward and backward, okay? We're not saying that now. We're saying that an equilibrium is reached. The number of electrons on this side equal the number of electrons on that side, okay? So therefore, there's no reason for the electrons to flow. Okay. Oh, and that's the end of that for today. Um, <laughs> right, I'm going to call it quits today. Um, yeah, um, I think that tomorrow we will continue with electrochemistry and we're going to just go on to the EMF and we're going to do the standard hydrogen half cell and that is it. I hope you have learned a bit and that you have a great evening. Cheers.